Okay, it looks like we can get going. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Johan, and I'll share with you a little bit about what we, our experiences have been with using Ansible for automating uh, sysadmin type tasks, um, specifically things related to, to Postgres. Um, post, uh, Ansible is quite large in, 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 in its coverage of various tools, operating systems, databases, etc. Um, and uh, I'll show you a few of the resources that you can go to if you want to learn more. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? Uh, I'll just introduce myself and the company. Um, then I'll describe our use case, what we use this for. Um, then I'll talk about Ansible, uh, the installation configurations that you, the options that you have, how to install Postgres with and without Docker. Uh, and then we'll look at a few examples of how the, the Postgres scripts, uh, what they look like, um, and then conclude. Okay, I'm a metallurgical engineer, so if I say anything stupid related to computers or anything, I've got a disclaimer. Okay. Um, I started this company, Xmente, uh, in 2001, but I've been coding since 1982. Uh, anybody know what that is? Familiar? You look too young to know that. Okay, those were my, my toys that I grew up with, ZX81 and Z, uh, ZX Spectrum. Um, cool stuff. This, this thing had erasers for keys, um, but yeah, I enjoyed it. And this is what I deal with most of the time at the moment. Uh, we try to always stay as much as possible in Linux. We use a lot of Python and Cython and, and in Postgres. Okay, uh, the company, uh, we do pyrometallurgy stuff, uh, high temperature metallurgy. So 1700 degrees Celsius is just about right. Um, anything else is, is, is a bit cold. Hydrometallurgy, uh, that's getting metals uh, out of the, the ores with with water-based systems, uh, acids, and, and those types of things. Um, so metallurgy, or extractive metallurgy, is basically getting valuable metals out of ores, which is a big thing in South Africa because we've got a lot of resources, um, and to, we need to take care of our industry. And that's part of what we do, uh, because it is the, the foundation of our economy. Okay, uh, we do lots of um, modeling and simulation work with open source tools. Um, we deliver part of our services through web-based applications, so we build process models and then our users can access them through uh, the web browser and they can run simulations through there. And uh, yeah, we love Python uh, because we're engineers and Python has a lot of technical and scientific tools that uh, comes with it. Okay, so what is our story? Um, we have several applications that we deploy to our clients, and we, um, we used to install them on DigitalOcean VMs, a few physical machines, and we did automation with Fabric. One of the guys tweeted yesterday about Fabric. He, he was skeptical about whether Ansible is better than Fabric. Um, we did use Fabric, and it didn't really get, help us a lot. You've got to do a lot of Python scripting to, to use it. Um, it. It was not fun. Yesterday I said it was hell, but, and that's more closer to the truth. Uh, but I would not recommend Fabric um, if, you can, if you can use Ansible. And one of the things that we ran into is the simulation stuff that we do is, is, is CPU heavy. Um, so you need a, a powerful CPU to, to run these things. And to get that type of CPU power in the cloud is still expensive. Um, so we decided to, to uh, uh, buy a few physical machines and we run those on there. Um, so the scope of the use case that we, that we use Ansible for, uh, we have a li limited number of servers that we have access to. Uh, it's limited hardware, multiple customers. Um, Customer data must be isolated because uh, we play with the big boys in, in, in the mining industry. Um, you don't want to upset them by um, contravening an NDA or something. Um, I don't have the money to defend myself against that. Um, we also deploy multiple applications and different application configurations. For example, production, training, testing. 
um, on the same server. Um, the tool stack that we use is uh, we use Ubuntu Server as operating system. Docker is our container host. And then we have uh, database server containers, uh, application server containers, and um, the, the pro reverse proxies uh, we use Nginx for. Okay, so that's, that's the tool stack uh, that we use. And we, the entire deployment of, of this, we deal with, uh, we automate it with Ansible. Uh, from a fresh uh, Ubuntu install, a server install, um, you run the, the Ansible playbooks and it fires up everything up to this point. Uh, we use remote backups, uh, Tarsnap for that, but I think Hendrik mentioned it earlier as well. I don't know if he gets kickbacks. Um, so the key requirements for us for automation after having dealt with, with Fabric um, was, okay, first of all, we needed to maximize our hardware utilization. So I want multiple applications and customers on one piece of hardware. Um, and, and multiple, uh, our uh, simulations are single core. They're heavy, but they, they're single core. So I can service a number of clients in parallel uh, running simulations on a multi-core CPU. So we wanted a single point of, of configuration, which Ansible um, largely took care of. And we wanted to manage all life cycle stages um, from provisioning of the software, deployment, maintenance, uh, even uh, migrations. Uh, we deal with all of that. And if you want more information on this, you can uh, go on YouTube. You can find the, the talk of yesterday. Um, so we needed good product documentation. And the scripts that we write need, needed to be well documented as well because it helps if you, if you can read the script three months after you've written it, uh, because then you're the other guy. Um, okay, so we selected Ansible for, for this task. Why? Uh, it was based on tools that we already knew. Python, YAML, and, and Jinja2 templates, text templates, that's the stuff that we already use in, in the Django environment and in our scientific computing. Um, so because Ansible is written in Python, it's it's easy to, to figure stuff out. Uh, it's really simple and, and quick to learn. It's flexible. Uh, we have had a fairly complicated um, uh, use case, and it, it was more than capable of dealing with that. Uh, you do no server-side configuration. The only thing that you do need is uh, SSH must be um, active on the server, and the port must be open, and you have to have Python installed on the server. Then you're good to go. So it's a very limited setup on the server side that you, that you need to take care of and, and then Ansible can help you. Um, and another thing is it's largely self-documenting. You'll see my scripts. Uh, I don't have any comments. I like YAML, the fact that it can, you can use comments, but Ansible makes it almost unnecessary to do comments. Um, and you'll see that in the examples that I show. Okay, so if you need to, to express yourself a little bit better, then you can use the comments. Okay. So who has used Ansible before or are familiar with Ansible? A uh, few of the guys, okay. Um, if, you, uh, if you know more than me, then you can chip in and, and correct if I'm saying something wrong. Okay, but let's look at what it is. Uh, what is uh, yeah, so what is it? Uh, it contains three uh, major parts. The first is the automation language, which is based on YAML. Um, then you've got the op uh, automation engine that processes these uh, scripts that you, you write in the automation language um, to automate your um, sysadmin tasks. There's also an enterprise framework called Tower. Um, if, you, if your implementations uh, become large and uh, enterprise-wide, I think that's a good place to go. We've never tried it, so I can't um, comment on it. That's why it's empty. I'm not going to talk about it further. So what does it do? Um, you can, it actually does several things for you. Um, software provisioning. So you've got a clean, brand spanking new server. Just install the OS. Um, and from that point forward, everything else that you need to, to have on that system, um, Ansible can help you with that. Configuration management, making sure everything is consistent across all your servers. Um, that's a big thing because uh, if humans do this, 
you, you know that there will be differences. Even though you've got standards and procedures, uh, there's, there, there's always the chance of um, making a mistake. Um, application deployment, that's a big thing for us, to push, uh, push our, all our applications through uh, the first time, and as we modify them, the, the updates you can push through as well. Continuous delivery and orchestration, it all, it, it's all basically helping your sysadmin to, to do more with less. Uh, what's it like to use it? Uh, it's really simple. Um, the nice thing about the scripts are you code them, but you can read them. It's really easy to read them and really easy to understand them. Um, it, it's, it's an easy to learn tool. It's intuitive. As you write the scripts, that's the sequence in which they will be executed. Um, uh, so you, you get what you expect. Um, and it's really easy to get started and quick to get started. If you decide today uh, you want to, to do something with Ansible, probably tomorrow you, you, you can already have uh, useful scripts running. Okay. It, it, it's that um, quick to, to get started. It's powerful. Um, it's got a wide range of tools. Ansible tools are called modules. Um, and there's a, a whole variety of tools that you can employ for, for automation. And they all work out of the box, which is nice. Uh, it's agentless, so you don't um, install anything on the server. Uh, it uses SSH for Unix-like Unix -like systems and WinRM for, for Windows. Um, so you don't do a, any agent installs, and you don't open any additional ports on your, on your machines. It's only the SSH port that, that remains open. Um, Ansible is declarative. That's how it works. So it's not simply steps that must be executed. You actually specify the state of the system that you want to maintain. Um, and what makes this uh, really nice, um, I really love it, is if, let's say you have uh, machines that have been running for a few years and you, you add one machine to your inventory. And that machine only has the OS on it. You can uh, run the same set of scripts on your entire inventory. And Ansible will bring the new machine up to the state that's specified for all your machines. You, so you don't need to run separate scripts for new machines and old machines, which is really cool. Uh, what is its purpose? Okay, so you reduce uh, complexity, um, definitely, setup time and maintenance time. And you also improve the sharing of know-how because once you've sorted out a task or set of tasks in an Ansible uh, playbook, then everybody can read it. It's accessible to the entire team. So it's a really nice uh, way to sort that out as well. Reliably, um, it's improved consistency and productivity. And something that we discussed yesterday is I think it, it really improves scalability because once you've started to implement Ansible, the number of machines are no longer an issue. If you've got one machine doing a specific task or 10 machines doing a specific task, it's as if you are managing one machine. Because all the automation runs for, for that group of machines exactly the same. Which, if you've got one sysadmin, yeah, that's, that's the way to go. And if you make use of all these benefits, then if you've got your own business, you'll make a, hopefully a bit more money. Your company can as well, your, your employer. And if you're the sysadmin, it can help you to have a life as well. Okay. Um, which operating systems does Ansible run on? The control machine, that's the one that runs the, the, um, the playbooks. Um, you need a, a Unix-like system, so Linux... Uh, iOS or one of those, um, and you do need Python installed. Um, Windows not currently supported. Yes. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay. So, but native Windows, you can you cannot run the the um, control environment on that. But okay. So there's a way to to get it running on Windows, which is fantastic. Uh, the managed machines can uh, be Unix-like via SSH. Windows via WinRM, and a large number of cloud resources. There's, there's others uh, other than Google and AWS and, 
and um, Azure as well, um, you can look at the documentation. Licensing. Um, Ansible is from Red Hat, and we heard a talk yes, yesterday about how they, the philosophy of how the, they work. And they, all their tools that they purchase into the company, they make open source. And then they build commercial services on that. So the Ansible engine and Ansible Tower are both open source. And if you an enterprise client and you really need support, then you can, you can get that through um, Red Hat. Uh, resources. If you want to learn about Ansible, uh, the documentation is, is great. So it's a good place to start. Uh, it's got an installation guide to get you started off uh, really quickly. Um, you can look at all the modules by category, all the database modules, security modules, etc. Um, also part of the, uh, the documentation. Um, the source code you can find on GitHub. So if you need to, 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 to get a little bit more insight into how it works, then you can actually look at the, the Python files. And there's examples inside the source repository, a few examples, and then they've got a whole GitHub repository dedicated just to Ansible examples as well. Um, so, so there's not really no excuse for not being able to get um, started quickly. Um, on the Ansible website, they've also got this uh, Ansible resources page where you can find ebooks, videos, and all kinds of things as well. Um, DigitalOcean also has an Ansible page where you can see that they've got 27 tutorials, uh, questions and projects that you can also look at um, to, get, to help you. Okay, so Ansible concepts, uh, terminology, what is the, the language that they speak, so what, what's called what. Uh, you already know about the control machine, that's the thing that runs the scripts. Then you've got your inventory. That's all the machines or res cloud resources that you're trying to manage. Um, the tools, I've mentioned it already, they're called modules. And one um, Ansible module is one Python module, which if you know Python, that means it's one Python file. Okay. Um, and uh, what does the layout of an Ansible project look like? So you host it in a, in a directory. Um, it contains multiple files. Uh, the first uh, file that you need is uh, the conf Ansible configuration file. With that file, you basically tell Ansible that it needs to look for the inventory in this directory. Otherwise, it will go to etc Ansible somewhere and, and f find it in a central place, which is, most of the case, not what you want, because you want to check this whole um, directory structure into source control. Okay, uh, The hosts file. Um, is the um, inventory. It lists all the machines and you can divide them into groups. Uh, a machine can belong to, in, in, to more than one group, so it's really nice to, to organize um, all, your, all your resources. And then you can have multiple playbooks. Uh, the playbooks are the things that you run, um, the scripts that you run. There's also a central host var directory, a subdirectory in the Ansible project directory. Um, and in the host var directory, there's a, a YAML file for each of your hosts, where if you want to, to conf do some configuration specific to a host, then that's where you do it. Okay. So you can, you can do a lot of generic things, but you can go specific to a host as well. Uh, the var directory, um, contains variables and settings in the form of YAML files that apply system-wide across all the, all the inventory that you've got, not to just one specific machine. And uh, we, sp we use one single settings.yaml file uh, to store our entire um, central configuration with uh, user configs, uh, product configs, uh, um, generic host configuration, and all of those things. And then you've got the roles. Now, roles are basically reusable playbooks. Um, and it, this helps with the modularity of implementing uh, Ansible scripts. Uh, when I started off, all the examples I could find was basically in one single file. Uh, and that made me very worried because I could see this is going to become spaghetti code and uh, I'm not going to survive using this thing. And then I discovered this. Um, a directory structure, 
and it's really modular and, and nice to work with. And each role can have its own set of variables or settings. It can have files, resources that you would like to, when you, when you deploy things or you provision things, the files that you want to um, copy over to the host. Let's say Nico just in a previous session talked about the Postgres uh, RC file, the config file. As part of, let's say you, you, you're provisioning a, uh, a server with Postgres on it, then your Postgres RC file is there. Um, when you log in, all your personal settings and everything, it's, it feels like home. It's, uh, so all of those things can be taken care of. Templates. Uh, I mentioned before it uses Jinja text templating. So if you want to uh, create a text file that must be delivered to the server, but the, the text file is a function of a whole bunch of settings that you've defined, either in the central var directory or in the host var directory. Uh, Jinja basically copies and pastes those settings in, in the uh, text template, and you've got a configuration-specific or a host-specific configuration file that you then send to the server, uh, which is really nice. Tasks are the actual things that are run, uh, where you create directories, create users, create databases, all of those types of things. And then handlers are things that sometimes run, it's almost like an event handler, uh, dependent on which tasks are running and what happens with the tasks. Um, and, uh, uh, a handler will run. For example, if you executed a task, uh, a task that makes it necessary for the server to restart, then you can activate the handler, and only when the, if that task had executed will the server restart, Okay, which is nice. This should give you an idea of all the types of modules that, uh, that you have available in Ansible. Cloud things, cluster, commands, crypto, database, files, a whole bunch of stuff. We only use a few of them, um, but there's really a, a large set of tools available. Um, so let's look specifically now at Postgres. What does um, Ansible have available for Postgres? There's the Postgres SQL DB module. So you can add and remove uh, databases to, to and from a remote uh, a host. You can also use this um, module to back up your database, to make dumps. Okay. Then there's the schema um, module for creating and, and deleting schemas. Uh, users, you can automate creating your users and even assigning um, rights to them with that module. You also have a privileges uh, module that you can use to assign privileges to, to different objects. Um, you can add and remove extensions like uh, PostGIS. I think there's a talk running now on PostGIS. But you can add those things. And you can also add your procedural languages. If you want to write your stored procedures in Python, for example, then you install the procedural language uh, into the database, and then you can use that. Um, Hendrik yesterday I mentioned um, DevOps. It's something that I wasn't aware of, uh, but th this is for Debian-based operating systems. Uh, it's additional tooling. It's based on, on Ansible, if you read there. Ansible is used as the main configuration management platform. Uh, I haven't really looked at it, at this yet, uh, but that it's additional set of tools to make, things, uh, make your life uh, easier if you're using Debian-based distributions. Okay, that was uh, all about Ansible. Now, if we think about post, uh, Postgres, how can we install it on the server? The, probably the standard way of doing it is just have a host operating system installing Postgres on there and running it as is. So that's the, this is the one case that I will demonstrate in the examples. Uh, pretty simple. Um, you will connect with Ansible through SSH, and then you can talk to the database and do whatever you need to do on the database. Uh, another um, configuration that's becoming very popular, uh, we use this, is, is to um, use a containerized installation of Ansible. Um, 
it's literally, I think, if you, if you have good internet, then you can have Ansible up and running on your machine in about 30 seconds. Um, more, more or less correct. Um, in that case, you don't um, talk to the, the, the Ansible server directly. You need to install the, uh, the Postgres, oh, sorry, the, the Postgres uh, server. You need to install the Postgres client on the native operating system. And that, uh, through that um, client, you then talk to the, uh, to the database as if it's another machine on the network. So it's one extra line. You, you specify the host name, and then you've connected to your, your Dockerized um, database server. Uh, really important, um, we don't store data in Dockers, right? Uh, unless you have a death wish. Um, there is a use case. Um, Benny presented it yesterday. Um, they use it for testing, so they make a Docker image with all their data inside, and within a fraction of a second, they can um, up a, a Docker container with a, an entire testing database inside it, which is a really nice way of doing things. Okay, um, so I'm going to go through a few examples in Ansible scripts now, and the project that I'm um, going to show you is actually a really simple one. There's no roles and, and vars and, and, and host vars. Um, I just want to take you through the Ansible specific um, uh, usages of the modules to focus you on that. Uh, I'll go through the, the config file just to show you what it looks like, the host file, and then through, I'll quickly step through each of these modules. Okay. Um, okay, let's do that first. Can, oh. Okay, so this is the, the Ansible config file. Um, the, the most important thing that we're doing here is we are telling Ansible that the inventory is contained in the hosts file. So you can actually call it what you will, may. Um, and the, the inventory can either be in .ini format, the old um, config file format, or in YAML format. Um, and if you want to have a look at uh, example config files or example hosts files, then just go to the GitHub repository. Um, to the source code repository, they've got examples in there, and in, in, that, um, in one of the directories, they've got an, uh, examples of, of these files. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff that you can configure, um, pages and pages of them. Uh, this is all that. Uh, this is the, the most important thing that I'm using this for. Okay, so next, the host file. Uh, this is a really simple one. Um, so it's basically a dictionary of all your machines, and I've got a group called my hosts, I could have called them DB servers as well, and under the, uh, the hosts um, dictionary, you can list all your servers. It's really nice and clear. Um, you can do, you can put your host variables in here as well, in the, in the central hosts file. Uh, we've done that previously. Uh, it clutters it a lot. It makes it uh, a, a lot more difficult to have a, an overview of in, your inventory. So rather move your, your configuration settings and things to the host vars directory uh, into a, a separate YAML file for each of the machines. Okay, next. Um, the first playbook that I've got here um, is, I don't know if you can read that, is install Postgres native. So if we're not going to do a dockerized install, just native on the operating system, um, this is what this playbook does. So there's two uh, tasks that are running here. Uh, we're going to update all the software, sudo apt get update, upgrade, auto remove, all of those things. We're going to run that, and then we're going to install the software. Okay, all the utilities that uh, we like, and then Postgres itself as well. So to update all the software, we're talking to the app mod uh, the apt module, which on Debian is the, the package manager. And we're telling it, uh, update the cache. That's basically sudo apt update. Um, and then upgrade. 
there's several configurations, safe, uh, um, there's a number of them uh, that will uh, handle it differently. And then auto-removed, you want to auto-remove um, unused packages. Um, in, uh, so it can do that as well. Um, then to install all the software, we again using the apt module. And what this does is, okay, that's the name of the task. And you can now see, I'm not using any YAML comments. But these names are sufficient to document what I'm doing. This is perfectly readable. Okay? Um, I'm using the apt module again. I'm going to install something with, with a name item. This is actually a piece of, of a Jinja template. Um, and uh, should we up update the cache? We're doing that all the time. And then we just loop through all the pieces of software that we want to install. So this is actually the command at, at the top here. And I'm going to do that for each of those. Really nice and compact, clean. Um, so I'm going to install htop3, uh, postgres, and postgres uh, contrib all the stuff that you want on there. So that's for a native install. For a dockerized install, there is a little bit more involved. Um, again, the top one is the same as previous, just update, sudo up, update, upgrade, auto remove. And then we're going to install all our software. Um, in this case, okay, it's the same thing again, pretty much the same thing. In this case, we are installing Python pip, because we need the, uh, to install a Python module, um, a Postgres-related one. And then we're just going to install not Postgres itself, but the Postgres client natively on the machine so that we can talk through it into the Docker. OK. So that's the software installations. Uh, then with pip, so I'm using the pip module there, um, installing PsychopG. Um, that's basically the, the Postgres driver for Python. Okay. So then I'm almost good to go. I need to install Docker. But first of all, we're going to install all the, um, the Docker prerequisites. Now, I could have just in, included it in the, in, the, in the list above as well. But to break it down into logical pieces of work, it helps. It makes it... Uh, uh, well. I don't know who has ever uh, read the, the Zen of Python. Nobody. You should. Okay. Um, one of the, the statements there is explicit is better than implicit. So this, this is a, a more explicit way of doing things. If you just had one uh, um, list of all your software, it would be more implicit and dif uh, more difficult to, to understand. Then we add the Docker uh, GPG key. Uh, with the apt, uh, apt key uh, module, we add the Docker um, apt repository um, so that uh, Docker can be installed from that repository with apt. And then we install Docker itself. Because now we've got, we can, we can access the Docker repository and it's simply just sudo apt install Docker CE. And finally, what we do is uh, we've got everything installed now, but now we need to create a Docker container that runs Postgres. Um, and this is how you do it. So we use the Docker container module, the Docker container tool uh, from Ansible, and we tell it we want to use the, the Postgres image. So the Postgres image is going to be pulled from Docker Hub, that's the entire installation of the system. So that takes about 30 seconds on fast, uh, fast internet connection. Then you've got an entire machine set up with, with, Ansible, uh, with Postgres. You, name, you give it a name. That machine will be known on, on the local network on, on, your, on your server as, as DB server, um, the host name as well. And then you map volumes because we don't want to store our data inside the Docker, so we need to map volumes to the native uh, server file system. Um, we can also um, map the ports. 
Uh, in this case, I'm mapping the Postgres port, which is open on the Docker, through to the hosts, uh, the same uh, port on the host. So from outside, you can then, through the, the standard Postgres port, uh, connect to the server and, and, and talk to Postgres. Um, you can do some environment variables, uh, manipulate or set your, your Postgres password, which you can get in a safe way through a, a settings file. And, and Postgres, uh, uh, Ansible has something called uh, Vault. So for sensitive information, um, you use the vault to store things that you want to, to re, uh, keep encrypted because uh, you don't want uh, passwords and things in plain text. Okay. Um, then uh, this uh, machine will be, uh, the Docker will be restarted. Uh, the restart policy on that uh, Docker container that I've just created will be, uh, should it uh, fail, it will automatically restart. And when the machine restarts, it will also restart. Okay? Um, and after this task, run, task runs, we want the Docker container to be in that state. That's the, the declarative bit. So you, we want this. Uh, it's actually all the declarative bit, but uh, that specifically, we want to leave the system behind in, in, a, uh, in, in a running state. Okay. Next, how do we create databases? Okay. Um, so over here, we're going to create an app database. Uh, we specify the name of the database, uh, the login, uh, the, the, the host to login, and the user and the password. Now, if you had a native Postgres install, you wouldn't use the login host because it will be the native host. Uh, since we are talking to a Docker, uh, a Postgres server inside a Docker, this basically, um, the native machine will then start talking to the Docker through the host name. Okay, which is uh, pretty simple. To create uh, a schema is roughly as simple. Uh, same connection details on that database. We want to uh, create a, a Postgres schema with the name app. Okay. So once this is executed, you will have uh, that schema created. You can also then create um, users. And you can have a list of users and loop through them, create them all at once. On that um, database, we're going to create a Django user with that password, which is a bit naughty to put it like that. And you can set privileges right there and then already. Okay. Um, if you want to add extensions like Postgres on, onto your, your server, um, in this case, we, we, we want to install with the Postgres um, extension module, we want to install the Postgres extension um, into the database called Acme. Okay, pretty simple. Um, if we want to add procedural languages to, to a database, um, my example is Python because we like it so much. Uh, so if you want to add uh, Python to test DB, you just specify the language um, and the state, there should be a space there, um, uh, should be present and then it will install it for you. And there's a variety of, uh, you can remove it, um, you can remove it with all its dependencies because sometimes uh, Postgres will not allow you to remove a, a language because it's being used in certain components. Then you can specify um, cascade uh, through, I think, cascade, yes, and then it will remove that language with, with all its dependent objects as well. Okay. To back up your database, you can just dump an existing database with the Postgres DB um, module again. The name of the database the state is dump, and then the target where you want to store it. You can also store it in a, in a compressed file by just uh, changing the uh, extension. Um, and you can, if you, if you need to, you can also only dump a single um, schema. Okay, so those are the examples, and I've got one minute left. Um, so the conclusion, 
Uh, what's good and bad that we found about Ansible? Uh, I really like YAML. Somebody, one of the presenters yesterday complained a little bit about YAML, but okay, that's not my problem. Um, it's really clear and simple, and I think you can agree by, by looking at what I've shown you. Um, it's really vastly better than, than scripting with, with Fabric. Um, the, the declarative configuration makes life a lot simpler, like I explained earlier. You can run all your scripts uh, on all your machines regardless of their state. Um, it can deal with both simple things. Um, each one of these playbooks you can run on its own, but also complicated things. The bad things, in our use case, you have to loop through applications and configurations and, and, a, and a few things. The looping and lookups becomes a little bit complicated. Uh, you have to have Python installed before you can uh, use Ansible, but yeah, you don't need to complain about that. SSH, I, I find a few SSH problems here and there, connecting while I'm developing, but it's not a train smash. And I haven't been able to, to connect directly into a, a remote Docker container yet. There are ways of doing it, but uh, we just haven't completely implemented that properly. Okay. I don't think there's time for questions because I used the full 40 minutes. So, but if you have questions, you're welcome to, uh, to catch me outside. Uh, do we have a break after this? Hello? Hello? Okay, so we have lunch now. Okay, so um, we're going to the Pomelong.